Welcome to Discover Christian Church. Our mission is to love God, love people, and impact the world. Well, thank you for joining us again, whether you're doing that online or joining us here in the building. We're glad to be worshiping together and enjoying God's presence. Uh, again, as Rachel said on the uh, announcement video, uh, thank you for all your help with the Ukraine situation, um, for taking those buckets. Um, if you are interested in doing more, this uh, QR code or the URL screen, our URL code on your, on your screen, um, if you're checking us out online, you can use that to give money to directly make a difference in Ukraine, and so we ask you to do that. Now, we're going to leave that up for just a minute um, so you can get your phones out if you haven't contributed and want to do that. But let me just briefly, briefly mention our Go Beyond Stewardship campaign information meetings. Those are mostly happening in life groups, um, but there's also one today, like right after this service, so if you don't have a class that you're going to, you should go to the information meeting unless you're in a life group. You really need to know what's going on, and this is a chance for you to hear about um, what the inform or what the information, what the uh, stewardship initiative is all about, and give you a chance to ask any questions that you would have as well. So um, if you also are interested, next Sunday at both 9 o'clock and 1030, we have those here in the building, and you can sign up at the Welcome Center. I just want to remind you, the stewardship initiative is called Go Beyond, and that's the goal. We want to go beyond in our mission, in our vision, and in our prayer with the primary purpose of doubling the number of disciples in the Discover context within five years. Go Beyond is about increasing our faith and making disciples through the stewardship of our entire lives, which includes our abilities, it includes our calendars, and it includes our finances. And part of the Go Beyond initiative includes important maintenance on our facility, some renovations, and the ordinary capital expenditures for our facility, which ranges from almost 20 years old to over 50 years old, which is old. <laughs> So, but here's the thing. We want to consistently focus on this prayer. God, what are you asking of me so that you can accomplish your will in the church that I love? That is our prayer. In fact, that was Paul's prayer. It was Paul's purpose, and we see that through his whole life, including his letter to the Philippians. We're in week six of our journey in Philippians right now, and Leah Brown is going to come right now and read our text for us. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let us all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction, their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Thank you, Leah. Uh, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Um, God, we ask that you would give us each um, individually, clarity regarding the one thing you want us to wrestle with right now. Make us a little more like Jesus through your word and your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, as we begin our text, let's 
look at a few things that Paul is not. All right? Paul isn't. First of all, let's read verse 12 one more time. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or I've already reached perfection. Paul isn't perfect. Okay, he, could, he clearly says that. I'm not perfect. We are not perfect either. No one is perfect but God. And we need to keep that in mind as we live our lives together. Second, Paul is not arrogant. Though you might infer that as you read through this little text. But look what it says a little more, uh, one more time in, in verse 15. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. Mature people, spiritually mature people, are unified in the truth that they haven't arrived, and they press on taking the next step of faith in their journey. And if someone doesn't understand that, who's going to make it clear to them? Not you, not me. God's going to make it clear to them. So just keep pressing on. In verse 17, he says again, Brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. People can be inspiring. You can be an inspiring example. Paul says something very similar in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1, he says, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. So, therefore, when I don't imitate Jesus, don't imitate me. Finally, we see that Paul is not distracted, he's not discouraged, and he's not done. Again, verses 13 and 14, brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Paul says, I focus on one thing. I'm not going to be distracted, I'm not going to be discouraged, and I am not done. What is that one thing he says? I press on. I'm going to press on. This one thing I do, I press on. Now, how do we do that? You guys should talk about this in your life groups. How are you pressing on? Or in your own time this week, how are you pressing on? But here, let's, let's look at just a few ideas that might help us to press on. First of all, we need to forget the past and don't let past challenges hold you back. Now, when you reach a certain age, it seems to happen more frequently, but have you ever gotten frustrated because you couldn't remember something? Raise your hand, be honest. A name, a date, where your keys are, where your phone is, why you actually entered the room, right? No idea. And then you get distracted doing something else. Generally, forgetting something is not good. However, at times it's helpful to forget some of the things of the past. To be super honest, it's hard for us to forget, right? We, we typically don't really forget the past, especially if something has been traumatic. However, we can learn not to focus on it so much. I think that's part of why God says this in Isaiah 43, 18, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. Listen, every person on the planet needs to know this truth. God is for you, and our enemy, Satan, is against you. God is for you, the enemy is against you. And here's just one of the many ways that this will show up in your life. The Holy Spirit will use the challenges of your past to move you forward. The enemy will use the challenges of your past to make you get stuck. He's going to hold you back. Not only that, the enemy will lie all along the way. Here are just a few of his lies. God can't forgive me. And more often, if we're truly honest, that's this phrase, I can't forgive myself. That's a lie. 1 John 1, 9 said, says, if we uh, confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and, and cleanse us, to purify us from all unrighteousness. In other words, we confess our sin and God says, I'm going to wipe that out. If we're followers of Jesus, if we've given our lives to the Lord, we are cleansed as if we had never sinned. Don't let past challenges hold you back. Here's another lie. I can't forgive that person. 
Well, remember that forgiveness releases you. Matthew 5, 7 says, when you show mercy, you're going to be shown mercy. And I think that fits in this context. Don't let that person continue to control your life. Forgive them, and you'll find life-giving freedom. I'm not saying it's easy, but you can do it by God's grace. Don't let past challenges hold you back. Another lie, I'm too broken. You don't know all the things I've done. My life is just worn out. There's no hope for me. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Jesus says, come to me when you have these burdens that you can't bear, and I will exchange them for rest and my yoke, which is easy compared to the burden that you're carrying. And in John 10, 10, Jesus says, Listen, the enemy comes to do a few things. To rob, to kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life. And a life that is abundant and satisfying. Here's another lie. I must get everything figured out in my life before God will accept me. Wrong. Romans 3.23 says, everybody has sinned. We all fall short of this standard that God has for us. But everyone can be justified, again, made as if we had never sinned, because of what Jesus does. Do you notice the order there? The recognition that we sin comes first, and then the forgiveness comes the, the, the reality that God can wipe all that from our lives and make us perfect comes. The transformation that comes with the Holy Spirit. So you've got a cart and a horse. And you know what? If you think you've got to get right on your own before God, before you come to God, you've got them backwards. You can't get right on your own. That's a lie. But God can transform your life. You may be weighed down with some other past challenge. For example, Paul, like he had this really big issue in his past. He persecuted the church, like the people he's writing to. He was completely opposing them. And not only that, he was opposing Jesus directly. And yet, he is able to say, I forget what's in the past and I press on. Don't let past challenges hold you back. By God's grace, when you press on, the obstacles in front of you can become the victories behind you. Let me say that again. By God's grace, when you press on, the obstacles in front of you can become the victories behind you. But that's only possible with God. Again, our enemy's goal is to keep you from taking another step towards Jesus. Don't let him keep you from winning. Past failures and disappointments and challenges are like cement shoes. It can be hard to run in those. And it can be hard to remove concrete. But let Jesus and let other people in your life help you. Next, forget the past. Don't let past successes slow you down. You see, the enemy is also going to use our past victories to keep us from pressing on. He's going to say, you know what? You've arrived. Like, you, you did your part in the kingdom. Now it's somebody else's turn. You just sit on the sidelines. Galatians 6, 9, and 10 in the message translation says, so let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. At the right time, we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit. Right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. Don't rest on your laurels, right? Do not say, yeah, I'm done. No, you're not. I think another thing that can happen is we idealize the past, and that keeps us from pressing on. Oh, I wish I could go back to how things were. Like, remember how great it was when whatever is in your mind right now. Now, like you, I do miss some of the things of the past, but I'm much more excited about what God is doing. I'm much more excited about the future and where God is leading his church here and throughout the world. 
And truthfully, can, can we just be super honest? The past may not be as great as you remember, right? Franklin Pierce Adams said, nothing is more responsible for good days than a bad memory. <laughs> I think that's true. You want some biblical proof for that? That's just human nature. And here's some proof. This is from Numbers chapter 11, starting halfway through verse 4. And the people of Israel began to complain. Oh, for some meat, they exclaimed. We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. And we had all the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic we wanted. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this manna. Free meat? Really? They were abused slaves. But we had free meat. We are heading to the promised land. Do not long for the oppression and the bondage of Egypt. You know, it's hard to drive if all you ever do is look in the rearview mirror. It's also really dangerous. Don't do that. God does tell us that we should remember. Memory is important, but God tends to move forward, not backward. Have you noticed that? God moves forward. Jesus, in Matthew 4, 19, he says, follow me. That means he's going somewhere. Follow me, and I will make you into something. I will change you. I will transform your heart. I will make you fish for people. I will make you live on mission with me. Let's go. Let's go forward, Jesus says. In Acts 1.8, Jesus says, listen, you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to be those witnesses here in Jerusalem where we are. And then it's going to go to Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. Jesus is going somewhere. And we want to go beyond where we are right now with the good news and with our faith. It's good to celebrate the past, but it's not good to live in it. Instead, we want to look forward to what lies ahead. Look forward to what lies ahead. Let's imagine you're on a game show. You're a contestant, and you have this prize. Let's say it's like 500 bucks. Like, here you go, $500. And now, you can either keep the $500, or you can trade it for what's behind this door, right? And you're like, oh, I don't know. Like, sometimes there's like an egg, you know? That's what you get behind the door. Or it might be a new car. What am I going to do? Well, our enemy says, here's what you have. Look, look how shiny it is. It's so wonderful. This is a good thing. That's not a lie. There are some great things about this earth, about the things that God has blessed us with here, but compared to what's behind the door, and here's the thing, God is not going to give you an egg. God's not even going to give you a new car. God's going to give you eternal life. Life that goes on forever with everything that you ever need and, and the joys and desires of your heart and being in the presence of God and being in the presence of everything that is good and being able to golf without such a bad handicap, all of that. If you're not sure where that is, just keep reading in Revelation. It's like in chapter 48. So keep going. Don't forget the prize that's ahead of us. Press on towards heaven. Because we are citizens there forever. Press on. Press on. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25 says this. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away but we do it for an eternal prize. We press on, running for the prize that Jesus has already won for us and will hand to us at the finish line, the prize that lasts forever. And as we press on, 
realize you are not running alone. We are surrounded by others. We are encouraged by others, including those who have gone before us, and especially including Jesus himself. Hebrews chapter 12 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Now, as we press on, we may wonder, oh no, <laughs> where is the finish line? Like, I remember the first time I ran a 5K, run would be generous. The first time I participated in a 5K, I got kind of close to the end, but I couldn't see the finish line. And honestly, I just gave up. I just was like, I can't do this. I can't finish. And I started to walk. When I saw the finish line again, I began to run to get to the end. As we press on, we may wonder, well, where is the finish line? And when is the finish line? Well, that's a good question. No person is going to be able to tell you what your date of finishing is. But as long as Jesus hasn't returned and as long as you can breathe press on. Keep going. When you don't feel like it, press on. When you don't have much strength, press on. When friends aren't helpful and family is hurtful, press on. When your money is spent, press on. When your courage is spent, press on. When your strength is spent, press on. When your emotions are spent, press on. When worry is high and peace is low, press on. When you can't sleep and you can't eat, press on. When your self-worth is lacking, press on. When your confidence is crumbling, press on. When questions are abundant, but answers are absent, press on. When your car is broken, press on. When your air conditioning is broken, press on. When your phone is broken, press on. When your plumbing is broken, press on. When the relationship is broken, press on. When your heart is broken, press on. When guilt clings to you, press on. When serenity flees from you, press on. When you're tempted to look back, press on. When you're unsure of the next step, press on. When you're struggling to forgive that person, press on. When you're struggling to forgive God, press on. When life is hard, your body is soft, pain is strong, and faith is weak. Press on. And finally, trust that God has not given up. God is pressing on with you, and God is still at work in your life. Look at what it says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. And I am certain that God, who began the work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. Let's pray. God, thank you for pressing on in our lives. God, thank you for sending Jesus to show us what it looks like to run the race. Thank you that when he faced the most challenging obstacles, he pressed on. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and he scorned its shame because he saw the prize and the prize was 
to be with you again forever, but also, God, to bring us with him. God, whatever the obstacles would be in our lives right now, whether they're in front of us or behind us, God, we know that you can maybe not remove them. We know you can. Maybe you won't remove them, but you will definitely help us navigate them. You will help us get around them or get over them. And in fact, you may carry us over them. Or again, you may remove them completely. But no matter what it looks like, God, encourage us to take one more step with you, with your people, to press on toward heaven. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.